Well, thanks for that wonderful introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you guys tonight. I'm gonna to focus on surgical aspects for primary malignant brain tumors and the techniques that we use to achieve maximal safe resection. Um, I know you guys got some excellent talks from uh, Dr. Uh, Adamson and uh, Haji Panayas. And um, you know, this is sort of a little bit more of a focus on the surgical aspects rather than overall um, uh, information about uh, gliomas and, and whatnot. A quick um, overview of what we're gonna talk about tonight is uh, the utility of maximal safe resection and how we apply that to both high and low grade gliomas. Uh, surgical principles um, of, of neuro-oncology, um, the use of anatomic and functional MRI, the combination of that with diffusion tensor imaging, and how we map cortical and uh, subcortical language and motor functions. And then we'll touch on some emerging new technologies and how we are looking forward to applying them into neurosurgical oncology for malignant brain tumors. So I know you guys went over this in um, a previous talk, but uh, just to, to um, revisit, you know, it's important to understand a classification of uh, primary malignant brain tumors uh, because there are some uh, uh, big implications for how we do the surgery. So just uh, as a refresher, um, the uh, 2016 WHO classification of tumors is really focused more on molecular features of tumors um, in addition to you know, the, the old sort of standard uh, histopathology information. And you know, what, what this has boiled down to is really a classification of things uh, by their uh, status of whether or not they have an IDH mutation. Uh, and then you know, further beyond that, whether or not they have a 1P19Q co-deletion, which would make them uh, categorize with oligodendroglioma. Um, without the co-deletion, we're talking about an IDH mutant um, astrocytoma. And then really in the absence of those, um, even uh, recently um, uh, some information has come to light that with the absence of those with wild type IDH, even sort of regardless of histopathology, these tumors tend to behave much more like our classic glioblastoma, WHO grade four types of tumors. So that's really how I tend to think of them um, and uh, how to therefore apply some of the surgical principles. Um, you know, uh, glioblastoma uh, is where we're going to focus uh, the talk on, and it sort of needs no introduction. I mean, you guys have gone over this uh, quite a bit, but um, it is the most common and the most deadly um, primary malignant brain cancer. This is uh, by definition grade four, and we get approximately 20,000 new diagnoses per year. Um, it's really, you know, been a focus in recent years with some pretty high profile um, people that have suffered from and died from uh, glioblastoma. And, you know, we've got pictures here of um, uh, Ted Kennedy, Bo Biden, and John McCain, who all uh, recently suffered and, and ultimately passed away from this. So it's certainly been more prevalent in the news media. Uh, current treatments for glioblastoma, you guys, uh, I think, heard a little bit about this before, but just to refresh everyone, um, basically current therapies are pretty limited, um, but, you know, this is an aggressive, aggressive disease, and without any treatment, you know, the average sort of lifespan is just a few months. Um, radiation makes a big impact and extends that to an average of sort of 10-ish months. A good uh, surgery, uh, in addition to that, extends it by a couple of months as well as chemotherapy sort of this in this sort of additive stepwise fashion. Average recurrence though, even despite all those therapies can still take place at around eight months. And really, you know, as we have uh, discovered lately, as we, we get more and more understanding of the genetic factors that go into these tumors, favorable genetic profiles like IDH mutation or um, MGMT methylation, all those kind of things can uh, tip the balance and make you know, median survivals um, in, in those kind of patients a little bit longer, and, but we're still talking about just a couple of years. Um, one thing that we know uh, and is sort of a tried and, and true thing is that surgery is unfortunately not a cure for this disease. And we know that from um, uh, historical um, uh, scenarios where, you know, in the 1920s, uh, uh, neurosurgeons like Walter Dandy would perform a hemispherectomy on patients with glioblastoma. You know, that is the anatomic resection of half of their brain. Uh, this is really, you know, a radical form of surgery uh, to um, try to tackle this disease. And even in those instances, those patients um, all still eventually succumb to disease from contralateral recurrence. 
And why is that? Well, the problem with diffuse gliomas is really that they're an infiltrative disease. Even though they look circumscribed on an MRI, malignant cells, even at the time of presentation, can extend well beyond anything we can see on MRI and often into the contralateral hemisphere. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, you know, the high grade, the sort of central area of the, uh, that we see on the MRI, the sort of necrotic center and its contrast enhancing rim does contain um, uh, the highest number of malignant cells. And, you know, it's shown here sort of average number of cells that we're talking about for a three centimeter tumor, 10 to the 10th, six centimeters, 10 to the 11th. But even if we gross totally resect that contrast enhancing lesion and remove 99% of the cells, we still have 10 of the ninth uh, malignant cells, you know, this is, this is over a billion cells, which are, each one of which are capable of reforming a tumor. And these, again, you know, spread beyond the boundaries of conventional surgical resection. And we know this from uh, pathology studies, sampling, you know, taking um, uh, uh, autopsy specimens and sort of biopsying different areas at, at different distances from the tumor. And that's what's shown in the figure here is that, you know, even well beyond the margin of anything we see today on uh, the MRI, there's a, a high uh, infiltration of these malignant cells. And, you know, it gets scant, scanter and scanter as you get further away, but they're still there. And each one, of course, is capable of reforming a tumor. So, you know, what are our therapeutic approaches and how, how does that, how do they match up with what we know about the pathology and the sort of, you know, microscopic features of this disease? You know, we have a tumor, like we said, we can see this pretty clearly and well, in a well demarcated fashion on an MRI. We can remove it with surgery. Uh, and then, you know, we apply some local regional therapies like radiation therapy, usually to a two centimeter margin around the, the resection cavity. We follow that up with chemotherapy, which is you know, designed to, uh, in cytotoxic chemotherapy, which is really designed to attack uh, rapidly dividing cells. And those are going to really hit areas of you know, higher density. But you know, the big question remains, you know, what are we going to do about those few individual cells that um, sort of escape away from the, these uh, current sort of standard therapies? Well, that's you know, the area of active investigation um, what we're sort of dealing with now is, well, we've got these therapies and they do work, but we have to understand what to use and when and why. So surgical indications for these tumors, even knowing that they're a diffuse disease, are there. Uh, number one, we use these to confirm histologic diagnosis. We're not going to understand how to use further treatments without uh, histology. Um, in today's era, you know, really we need extensive tissue sampling to perform comprehensive molecular analyses like genomic sequencing to really understand what potential molecular targets there would be and how to match those, therefore, with uh, follow-up treatments. Um, relieve mass effect, like we talked about before, an extensive tumor resection with, you know, gross total um, resection of a contrast enhancing lesion does lead to a rapid, you know, two log cell kill, uh, disrupts a microenvironment, which might um, therefore, you know, remove some resistant uh, cells. And, you know, we do know with good data that um, this form of cytoreduction reduction does prolong survival significantly. Uh, in addition, uh, surgery, uh, surgical decompression, relief of mass effect, uh, restores neurologic function. And then all of this uh, also allows for the sort of potentiation or facilitation of those other treatments like radiation therapy and chemotherapy that aren't going to be feasible in someone suffering from um, you know, intracranial hypertension from a very large tumor. And then, you know, finally, there is the ability for uh, surgeons to introduce local antineoplastic agents. And I, I think you heard a little bit about um, gliadel wafers and, and things like that from some of the other talks. Um, so, you know, when surgery is not really indicated, we talk about doing a stereotactic biopsy. This is a safe and feasible kind of procedure that we can do, but um, it's not always necessarily a good idea. Um, you know, this is minimally invasive, um, but, you know, in the situation of highly vascular tumors or potential non-tumors like aspergillosis or in people with uh, coagulopathies, uh, biopsy is obviously contraindicated. But even so, even with it being minimally inv uh, invasive and in the right uh, situation, you still have a substantial complication rate. So it's not you know, um, without its own issues and some of the sort of um, percentage chance of, of some of these things happening are listed there. 
And the diagram shows basically how a stereotactic biopsy is performed using neural navigation and basically um, using that to plot a trajectory, drilling a burr hole and inserting a, a long needle uh, to depth of the target and sampling small tissue cores from that. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, one of the issues that we run into with biopsy is you know, the small amount of tissue that we obtain is not really uh, enough in many instances to run some of these uh, more recent uh, advanced molecular analyses. So when we don't think uh, biopsy is a good idea, we're talking about an open surgery or craniotomy and resection of these tumors. Uh, shown in this diagram are some of the standard approaches to um, lesions in various uh, areas uh, of the uh, supertentorial space as well as infratentorial space. These are the, the sort of incision and craniotomies uh, that are typical um, for tumors in various regions. Um, again, uh, you know, with the difference, uh, you know, most commonly with primary high-grade tumors, we're talking about supertentorial rather than infratentorial, although there are um, plenty which occur in the cerebellum or brainstem. Uh, in, in general, craniotomy should just be done to provide a short distance between the, uh, the tumor and the surface of the brain and big enough to allow some relaxation of the brain so it doesn't uh, herniate out as you um, open uh, the dura. Um, once the exposure and the approach is made, pathways into the lesion are sort of shown in this diagram here, which is one of these uh, wonderful uh, pieces of art from uh, Ian Souk, who is at, um, at MD Anderson. Um, previously. And uh, this shows um, the sort of various ways to reach a tumor at different depths. Uh, certainly one of the more common would be something presenting on, this, uh, on or near the surface. This is really probably the most relevant for uh, malignant glioma to be a sort of a transcortical approach and defining which areas of the cortex you can really um, uh, remove along with the tumor. Um, in deeper areas, such as the insula, you might uh, take an approach that goes um, uh, through normal anatomic corridors, um, uh, like the sylvian fissure or the interhemispheric fissure to reach uh, a tumor in the lateral ventricle through the trans um, uh, colossal approach. And then other more deep-seated tumors, and this probably applies a little bit more to brain metastases than it does for primary tumors, um, might be a transsocal approach taking advantage of normal sort of anatomic um, uh, avenues uh, to reach deeper into the brain without violating uh, otherwise normal uh, areas of, of brain. Uh, all this is to say that surgery in experienced hands is safe and feasible, you know, um, uh, and with, I think, in my opinion, relatively comparable, though maybe slightly higher complication rate to um, biopsies. Uh, shown here is data from a very large series of glioblastoma uh, surgery patients uh, treated at uh, MD Anderson, and you can see the overall sort of complication rates of a whole slew of different um, forms of neurologic deficits are, are, are shown here, and you know the, the estimates are around sort of 15 to 20 percent. And obviously, that varies tremendously by where uh, tumors are located, someone's presentation, um, and their sort of pre-morbid status. Um, but all of this is to say that um, uh, complications are, are at a sort of acceptable range and especially operative mortality. You know, patients always go into this sort of brain surgery or when someone proposes this, they think that there's a high likelihood of them dying on the table. It's actually extremely low and that's even within the sort of 30 day mark. So I think it's, you know, a common sort of misunderstanding there. Um, surgery for malignant brain tumors is the first step to treatment. Um, the MRI appearance really sets the goal of the operation. So high-grade tumors, glioblastoma, the goal is resection of the contrast-enhancing lesion. Although recent evidence points towards a uh, potential role for resecting the surrounding flare or um, uh, T2 signal, uh, around the contrast enhancement. Um, this is uh, often um, referred to as the edema surrounding a tumor, but I think um, histopathology examination certainly yield that there can be high density of tumor cells in this uh, region. Some data also from MD Anderson shows a benefit uh, to resecting 53% uh, or more of this flare region uh, in addition to the contrast enhancement. And I think you guys discussed 
a recent paper from um, uh, uh, Mitch Berger's group uh, also shedding light on this too, that when it's safe and feasible to resect beyond the contrast enhancement, there is potential for benefit. Um, in the setting of low-grade tumors, this is the tumor. The T2 flare signal is a tumor, and that is the target for resection and, uh, and a complete, complete removal of the C2 flare signal. But with that, um, I would put out there that lots of studies are showing that advanced MRI techniques or different forms of PET can identify um, more potentially metabolically active areas of the tumor and might help guide which portions of you know, large or multi-lobar lobar tumors might make the most sense to uh, target surgically. Why is all of this the goal? Well, we know from pretty extensive studies that extent of resection correlates with outcome. Gross total resection when done safely uh, confers the highest benefit and you know, this is confirmed all the way up to sort of meta-analysis scales. Uh, extent of resection has been studied, as mentioned here, pretty extensively in, in glioblastoma and shown here is um, survival curve from uh, that, that large case series uh, that I mentioned from MD Anderson. Uh, this dates back to some earlier studies showing benefit of um, high rates of resection from uh, this paper here from uh, LaCroix uh, in 2001, basically showing that a cutoff above more or less 90, 95% of the tumor was necessary for um, conferring a survival benefit. More recent studies have been able to demonstrate um, that, that even less than a gross total resection is also beneficial. And this study from um, Sinai and Berger in 2011 showed that um, extent of resection really down to 78% uh, or more was able to, to separate survival curves and show that there was a benefit to these sort of large, um, uh, though not complete resections. This sort of is in contrast to the concept that we have of the angry or wounded glioma syndrome, which tends to occur when resections are less than 50%. That sort of this incomplete resection can uh, cause in some circumstances sort of malignant uh, cerebral edema, um, hemorrhage, and other complications can be associated with that. So that a resection in that sort of lower category could actually uh, worsen someone's outcome in comparison to either no surgery or just a stereotactic biopsy. Um, you guys saw this slide before, which is uh, the meta-analysis showing that gross total resection correlates with survival in almost every um, study that has sort of meaningfully uh, looked at this. Um, and I think as time has gone on, this has become less and less of a controversial statement, um, uh, but certainly um, over the years has, has not always been um, high on everyone's mind, but I think you know now um, there's pretty widespread agreement on that, that gross total resection correlates with survival. The other part of it is, you know, on the flip side, residual tumor volume, you know, also makes a meaningful impact. Um, and that's shown in this uh, study here that really below um, one or two cc's of tissue left over, we can, we can see um, pretty ex extensive differences in median survivals. Um, between those who, who really have this sort of complete resection and low residual volume versus those that are higher. However, all of this comes with the knowledge that post-operative deficit can quickly erase uh, any survival benefit uh, achieved from a gross total or large resection of a tumor. Um, and that's uh, demonstrated, I think, quite well in this study from Margaret and, and folks who basically show that um, you know, any gains from large resection are offset, especially by uh, post-operative motor or language deficits. And the median survivals of patients you know, incurring those are really, are really dropped. So whatever benefit might have been gained is lost. Uh, and you know, at the same time, post-operative KPS is uh, probably a better determinant of overall survival compared to uh, preoperative, meaning that you know these folks have got to go through this surgery and not significantly impacted in such a way that they're not able to get uh, to go on to get those other critical therapies like chemotherapy and radiation. All of this data on extent of resection uh, has been 
used, uh, incorporated into mathematical models to create these normograms. Um, this was uh, from Nick Marco and company who took you know, data from several thousand patients uh, and uh, incorporated it into this um, uh, model where you can basically input patient's age, their extent of resection, their uh, additional therapies like temozolomide and radiation, and you can uh, get a sort of prediction of how um, they might do and how it might vary by the extent of resection in, in particular. And all of this data and all of these mathematical models all support this concept of maximal safe resection. Um, and as I mentioned, this was all extensively studied in glioblastoma, but what about the other tumor types like our lower, what we used to think of as low-grade tumors, IDH mutant tumors, or oligodendrogliomas? Well, similar things have been demonstrated in what we call low-grade gliomas or IDH mutant uh, non codeleted tumors, so not oligodendrogliomas, but um, you know, our astrocytomas. Um, multiple retrospective studies have similarly shown that extent of resection to have a benefit. I think one of the more interesting and compelling studies was this one from Jacola and all, which described this population-based study where different surgical strategies were compared in uh, some hospitals uh, that were actually in Norway, where um, one group favored uh, biopsy uh, up front versus another um, favoring you know, an extensive resection. Now, you know, this difference in, in um, sort of surgical strategy um, was certainly you know, prevalent uh, in the field prior to many of these studies. Um, you know, some of that came from this observation that low grade tumors are you know, slow growing and often are difficult to detect lesions and some of the old uh, thoughts were that these lesions are relatively stable. However, you know, more recently longitudinal studies were actually you know, track volumetric growth of tumors over time demonstrate that low grade gliomas, um, even though they're low grade, do tend to grow over time. And shown here is sort of a, a data you know, chart from one of those studies where if you track and you count and you sort of volumetrically assess these tumors that um, over, over the years, these things almost all uniformly grow. And they, at some point, um, many of them undergo malignant transformation where they are no longer sort of grade two indolent type tumor, but um, take on many of the features, you know, histologically, radiographically, and certainly clinically of high grade gliomas with rapid growth and poor prognosis. You know, one of the other things I think that's maybe a little bit lost in the weeds sometime when we're talking about, you know, low grade gliomas compared to high grade gliomas. Um, you know, high grade gliomas obviously are massively uh, fatal. You know, people are surviving a year or two. Um, but the five year and 10 year survival rate for what we call low grade gliomas is really not that dramatically you know, great either. Um, you know, we're still talking about a highly malignant and lethal disease you know, in comparison to many other malignancies. You know, low grade gliomas are still a, a relative poor performer. So and I think all this needs to be uh, kept in mind. Um, this slide shows uh, the data from that study that I mentioned um, from, from Norway, where there's basically you know, these two hospitals where one um, preferred resection, another preferred biopsy. And when they looked you know, at their study, uh, the patients that you know, ended up at one hospital versus another tended to do better if they went to the hospital where the upfront res resection was preferred. And you can see the, these survival curves um, are, are non-overlapping. And a uh, significant benefit was there with, with this upfront uh, resection thing. Now, this type of study I think is really compelling because it's really hard to do a randomized trial to do this kind of thing. And this um, might be as close uh, that we could get um, uh, you know, in, in the sort of modern era um, <clears throat> uh, without doing a fully randomized trial, which you know, many people would just simply not um, sign up for. So this data from the first one is really you know, akin to the sort of intention to treat sort of scenario where um, you know, the group in, in the one hospital were really more sort of resection forward versus the other one where biopsy was preferred. The other chart here shows what, uh, what happened with their survival comparing what treatment they actually got. You know, not every single patient that went to each hospital got you know, the, the sort of preferred treatment. 
but um, you know, data from this study show that those patients that underwent early resection um, did significantly better than those who only got the biopsy and watchful waiting. So I think you know this um, uh, bears out you know uh, along survival lines, but also you know similar um, rates of surgical complications, uh, neurologic deficits. Um, uh, uh, perioperative death and malignant transformation. So, you know, it all goes to say that these, this uh, kind of comparative study was able to show this big benefit for patients undergoing um, an upfront resection as compared to biopsy. Um, you know, more recently, when taking molecular factors into account, you know, the presence of the IDH mutation um, certainly shows, you know, that Tumor, a group of tumors that behave better overall. Um, but the concept of the complete resection still uh, bears importance here in that, number one, these tumors do tend to be more amenable to complete resection given their location, their often circumscribed nature, um, uh, and that when a complete resection is performed on, on these tumors, you know, there's something akin to a, a curate with some patients with some really long-term um, survival. Uh, in this particular study, you know, this, this same kind of uh, molecular analysis when comparing it to extended resection showed that really IDH wild type tumors are over here looking a little bit more like um, glioblastoma in terms of their, their outcome. Um, but even so, you know, the, the uh, image complete resection um, still, you know, was shown to confer that survival benefit. On the other hand, uh, oligodendroglioma tumors might be a little bit of a special case for extent of resection, although this is somewhat controversial. Again, these are those tumors that have IDH mutations and a 1p19q codeletion. So we know that these tumors are among the more sensitive primary malignant brain tumors, uh, to, sensitive to chemotherapy and, and radiation. And uh, in, in some uh, really long-term studies from uh, the Karen Cross group um, uh, has shown that you know, the, the combination of PCV chemotherapy and radiation uh, led to pretty uh, good long-term survival among these patients. Um, and uh, that just, I think, goes to show that these are a, a little more sensitive to chemotherapy and radiation. And when we compare that to what we see from data from the SEER database, it's actually harder to see a benefit from uh, gross total resection compared to just biopsy. Um, although it's a little bit, little bit murky if you um, dig a little bit uh, deeper to, to try to understand why patients might have subtotal resections or no, no surgery and, and you know, clearly there would be a difference there. But it does point to an idea that, you know, um, again, avoiding neurologic morbidity from surgery um, in a tumor that's a little more chemotherapy or radiation sensitive might, might be a good, a good trade-off in terms of um, overall survival and outcome. One of the issues, though, is you don't always know that a tumor is an oligodendroglioma based on its initial imaging. And, um, you know, if you're in there deciding, well, are you going to resect this all or not, um, you know, the, I think other considerations uh, end up taking uh, priority. But there are some, you know, some ways to try to differentiate if something might be an oligo versus uh, an astrocytoma. And some of that uh, are, are some of the things that are shown here, like cortical involvement, calcifications, uh, a little bit less distinct borders. Um, they tend to be cortically based, which I think you guys discussed in one of your um, previous talks, and they can sort of occasionally, although somewhat rarely, thin overlying bone. And the age range is maybe a little bit different for oligodendrogliomas than low-grade astrocytomas. But again, none of these things are 100% reliable. So we're often, you know, faced with what we think is a, you know, is a, is a primary uh, glial tumor. And if we're going in there, we're often thinking about how to remove it all completely, um, sort of regardless of, of what it ultimately ends up being. But you know, how can we resect tumors safely? Um, well, you know, using mapping methods to determine functional and eloquent areas uh, during, uh, you know, that need to be protected 
during a surgery uh, can be done with a variety of techniques uh, that are listed here, like anatomic MRI, functional MRI, DTIs, motor simulation, sort of awake language mapping. And all of this is required, of course, because functional cortex and subcortical white matter can be located within gliomas, even uh, high-grade um, uh, glioblastomas. So, you know, knowing that there's not a reliable sort of visual anatomic way to distinguish between, um, you know, the, the functional parts of the brain and the disease parts of the brain really poses this big challenge of how to, how to remove these tumors safely. So going through these, um, each sort of in turn, you know, the most sort of basic ways are to, to deal with anatomy, understanding, you know, where, where is the tumor located to you know, the sort of uh, normal anatomy of the rest of the brain. And the way we figured this out is with neuronavigation or frameless stereotaxy. This is where in an operating room, we register an MRI to the patient. Uh, this sets up a sort of coordinate system that's read by an infrared camera to help us um, localize exactly, you know, relative to, you know, where on a patient's head or in, in later on in the surgery inside, we are compared to an MRI. Uh, this allows us to incorporate the lesion and sort of known anatomic information when we have it from a basic anatomic MRI, but, um, you know, in and of itself doesn't really tell us anything about function. Uh, there are some limitations with neuronavigation that it's, you know, subject to brain shift. Um, you can use things like intraoperative ultrasound to update information um, when, when it works, um, which is, you know, uh, when a tumor is uh, hyperechoic on an ultrasound and not all low-grade gliomas are. Most high-grade gliomas are, though. Uh, intraop MRI can also be used, but, um, you know, I think um, this is a little bit controversial. It's also extremely costly and not necessarily available at every center. Um, this uh, is some of our um, studies looking at intraoperative ultrasound and comparing it with MRI features help localize a tumor and account for brain shift, um, which happens when, when you know, the skull is open, uh, cerebral spinal fluid is drained, uh, partial tumor resection is encountered, and you know, the brain can sort of sag down. And if you have that registered to the MRI kind of from the beginning of the case, um, things are not going to end up where they were. Um, so this is trying to trying to help account for that um, and track sort of a moving moving object and comparing it to um, uh, the neuronavigation, which can kind of show you know the extent of to which uh, these tumors can shift, and especially if you're bordering near uh, eloquent area, you know if you're just going off of this neuronavigation alone, uh, it could steer you directly into something like primary sensory or primary motor cortex. Uh, so um, that cannot be completely relied on. Beyond anatomy, um, we have uh, functional MRI, uh, which can give us some information about eloquent cortices and their location relative to tumors. Uh, this is a sort of non-invasive mapping um, system that can be used for motor sensory language areas. It works on the principle of neurovascular coupling, which is that increased blood flow um, happens in areas of cortical activation during a task. Uh, it is FDA approved. Uh, procedure for surgical planning. Um, it is, though, unfortunately, more accurate for motor than it is for language, and the sort of um, percentage accuracies and retrospective studies are shown there. Um, but we end up using it more for language since we have probably other and maybe more reliable intraoperative means to, to identify um, motor and sensory. Uh, one sorry, downside to it is that it shows <clears throat> all of the areas of the brain that are activated by a task and it doesn't really determine the effect of a lesion in one of those particular areas. So it tells us, you know, uh, not necessarily what is um, uh, the critical part, but really all potential regions, which is still valuable information. Um, in the majority of people, uh, language is lateralized uh, to the left hemisphere and knowing where these sort of active areas of, of brain cortex are relative to your tumor can help guide um, uh, trajectory uh, into a lesion for a resection. Uh, again, just a note about language lateralization. Uh, it's generally left hemisphere dominant in healthy individuals. 
Um, you know, less than 6% of right-handers, 16% of left-handers have atypical organization. It's actually more common to be um, bilaterally represented in speech than it is to be right dominant alone. Uh, and, you know, um, if, uh, if these critical areas of language um, are removed, other areas of the brain can't just relearn how to speak. And, and so, you know, it's imperative to protect these um, or risk uh, permanent aphasia. Um, you know, language, uh, some other functions, I, I think this was alluded to in other talks, can sort of move um, uh, after an injury um, to other hemisphere can accommodate for, for some injuries. Language is not one that can really do that with the exception of uh, language deficits from the supplementary motor uh, area. Um, uh, but, you know, thankfully, um, many post-surgical deficits can improve with time. Some compensation is there. Speech therapy can help as well. Um, and, and, you know, some of this has to do with uh, how, whether or not the patient is sort of young enough that there um, seems to be a uh, retained ability to reorganize a little bit better, especially in young children. But it's certainly not a perfect type of thing. Um, you know, I think this was touched on before, the sort of different sort of canonical areas of language activation in the brain, uh, these concepts of uh, Broca's area, Wernicke's area, angular gyrus, basal temporal language area, um, show up in sort of reproducible regions of the brain in, in many people, and we can incorporate them into our neural navigation to help us guide, you know, away from resecting them uh, at surgery. A uh, few notes on those different critical areas. You know, one that I don't think comes up all that often is uh, what we term the basal temporal language area. Uh, this is involved in object naming. It's sort of in the low temporal lobe. It's at the sort of lower margin of the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which I'll mention made, uh, later. But, um, you know, lesion here will cause uh, pure anomic aphasia. Um, I think you, we touched on Wernicke's and Broca's before, um, but I think you know the important things to, to understand are the sort of differences in the types of presentations that people have in uh, from those regions, and you know this uh, in particular, you know a Broca's aphasia from a, a Wernicke's type aphasia um, can can sort of help with your assessment of patients and monitoring them over time, and um, and sort of what to what to expect and what to expect when um, testing them awake intraoperatively. Uh, I think another critical um, factor in all this is that different languages can be located in different areas of the brain. So bilingual patients uh, need to be tested separately uh, for their different, uh, the different languages which they speak. And shown here is, sort of, is a patient bilingual in English and Spanish. And you can see where the English representations are of language versus Spanish, and I'll sort of toggle between those, and you can see the differences um, and how that might come into play in uh, in a surgery to resect this lesion, where you know a different approach might might put the different languages at risk, and so knowing uh, knowing that beforehand will certainly impact things on the intraoperative side of what and where to test. Uh, connecting all these areas uh, is an important thing to understand. You know the. The, the, the brain does not work by isolated cortical islands of activity, but all these areas are interconnected um, by white matter tracks, which can be quite well visualized by this technique of diffusion tensor imaging, which I think you guys have heard about or uh, talked about in some of the other other talks. But this is, you know, these this is imaging that we can perform that really allow uh, allows us to see these tracks by imaging the preferential movement of water along axons in the brain. Uh, this shows us, you know, these subcortical white matter tracks. And uh, what we can do is sort of place a seed or a start point in one area of the brain and see where those axons from that area end up. Uh, and this is useful to locate the white matter tracks involved in motor or speech, starting with the, the seed placed from the activations that we see in a functional MRI. So what does it look like when we put this together where we've got an anatomic MRI showing our lesion, we've got a functional MRI showing the, the language activation surrounding the lesion. We incorporate that into our navigation. We can see those activation sites, you know, those cortical activation sites. And then we incorporate the diffusion tensor imaging to interconnect those sites and show us where these critical white matter tracks are um, uh, in relationship to 
the lesion, and then we can determine a trajectory um, into a lesion or the sort of borders where we're likely to encounter functional uh, brain cortices. Like I said, it's useful to determine trajectory. Um, if we know that the language fibers are displaced anteriorly to a tumor, clearly we're gonna take a posterior approach. It's not necessarily evident just looking at the anatomic MRI alone that those uh, white matter tracks are going to be displaced you know, reliably. So you, know, you need to have that uh, separate imaging to understand you know, which way to approach many of these lesions. There is um, good level evidence to support the use of diffusion tensor imaging to preserve cortical spinal tract function. So again, this is motor, motor function. Um, this is given to us from uh, this study um, from uh, Wu et al. in, uh, in uh, China. They randomized um, about 240 patients to one group getting neuronavigation where they incorporated the DTIs and another group where they just had standard neuronavigation. Um, there was a uh, trend for improved rates of resection, uh, Karnowski status postoperatively, and actually overall survival in these patients, which I think to, to me was surprising, and I think, but I think it goes back to that same concept that you have to remove the tumor and preserve the neurologic function for the most benefit for these patients. So what happens when the imaging shows that neurologic function is really going to be intertwined or at least extremely close to a tumor. Well, in those instances, we've got to do interoperative functional mapping um, uh, to identify those locations and preserve them at surgery. Um, ideally, this works best when we can have some kind of real-time mapping, not one that's subject to brain shift and all those other problems that we mentioned before. So uh, this type of mapping can be done on both cortical and subcortical structures using uh, direct electrical simulation. This can be done with either a monopolar or bipolar probe like is shown here, where basically you know, two electrodes are applied to the brain, current passes between them, and that current inactivates or activates a portion of the brain depending on its kind of setting. Um, uh, you know, for cortical simulation, typically low frequency, uh, low amplitude <clears throat> uh, currents are applied, and subcortical can, can sometimes require a little bit higher current to elicit a response. As far as different types of functions, different uh, techniques can be applied for motor in particular. There are a variety of different things that we can do beyond this direct uh, cortical stimulation. There's um, phase reversal, motor evoked potentials, direct cortical stimulation, and subcortical mapping as well. Um, uh, starting from the top, uh, phase reversal uh, technique is basically when we are applying a sort of greater strip of electrodes to the surface of the brain in the region that we think is um, uh, uh, across the central sulcus of the brain. A change in the dipole um, of the current occurs over the central sulcus. So if we've got this grid of electrodes over, we're looking on the monitor to find where that phase reversal occurs, and that occurs over the central sulcus. It identifies that, you know, um, quite reliably in a way that just looking at the brain or looking at an MRI um, is sort of subject to uh, to error. And obviously, when it comes to motor or sensory cortex, um, you know the, the cost of being wrong is quite high. And then, you know another advantage of these is that they can be used under general anesthesia. Other sort of real-time uh, techniques uh, can be used, like motor evoked potentials, not of sensory evoked potentials, and these can be done um, transcranially or with a grid in place. And there is good data to suggest that these um, help predict postoperative deficit. Um, beyond that, we can do subcortical and cortical um, white matter motor tract mapping. And this can be done with the patient asleep as well, too. This is basically where we take a bipolar or monopolar probe and, um, and trigger uh, a motor response um, by stimulating someplace in the brain. And we're sort of getting a readout from the distal muscle groups. 
and studies indicate that the amount of current that it takes to trigger one of these responses, especially in the deep white matter, can correlate to the distance from those currents. And that's the really data shown from the study here from Shahar and, and company that, that's basically um, lead us to conclude that there's a correlation of about one milliamp per millimeter distance from um, these motor tracks. So this can sort of be done, the stimulation mapping can be done interchangeably with resection. And as you get closer and closer to the critical motor fibers, you see less and less amperage required to stimulate a motor response. And how this comes into play is when you have a, a tumor like this, that's really wrapped up in the motor cortex, you know, you, you go in there and you find a way into the lesion by going through some area of brain that does not stimulate or trigger a motor response or requires a higher amplitude to trigger that. And you can carry the resection closer and closer to those motor fibers um, by, by checking your distance and your sort of functionality of the brain in real time with the simulation. And again, we're sort of able to measure the responses from different muscle groups um, as, as we go. And these types of techniques enable us to be able to do a resection um, in, in many cases of, of tumors that are near highly eloquent areas, like in this case where you have a tumor really straddling motor and sensory and you know, pictures from the surgery might look something like this. Language mapping, on the other hand, um, requires an awake patient. Uh, this significantly complicates the surgery in some regards in that it requires an addi additional planning, often rehearsal, sometimes a larger craniotomy and longer operative times. Uh, stimulation um, is applied while testing functions, um, uh, in particular language, uh, counting, object naming, sentence completion, um, you know, and, and looking for interruptions to that um, from the stimulation. Um, you know, some other difficulties that are encountered um, can be, you know, inducing a seizure in, in patients by um, repetitive stimulation, but thankfully this can be solved with uh, cold saline. Um, when it comes to actually resecting tumors and, and using the stimulation mapping information, um, there's sort of two strategies that are undertaken. One is sort of a negative stimulation mapping, which is basically if, if an area of brain is stimulated and doesn't uh, induce a language or other functional deficit, then the theory would go that it could be safely resected. A positive stimulation strategy would sort of require identification of the region of brain responsible for whatever function you're looking for. So if you're looking for, you know, speech production, you would need to find the area that stimulation sort of it caused a halt in speech production to make sure that that was separate from the resection rather than just targeting the region of the brain uh, and, and checking that it didn't cause any functional decline. Um, I think, you know, one of the recent uh, things that we've come to appreciate more is that this classical language organization model not really tell the full picture. You know, this is the, the concept that sort of, you know, Broca's and Wernicke's area are connected by, by the arcuate fasciculus. That's certainly um, true to some degree, but the networks, I think, are much more complicated and, and varied. And I think an updated model um, is shown in this uh, figure here. This is a uh, paper from uh, Berger's group. And I think it, it shows how, um, you know, beyond just those sort of two classical regions, there's really language can be dependent on multiple areas, uh, multiple cortical interactions and subcortical white matter tracks. And the different nuanced studies um, help us appreciate how these different tracks uh, function and different types of errors um, can be uh, attributed to lesions in different areas uh, based on which sort of tracks are involved. So again, you know, what this looks like at surgery is this application of, you know, the bipolar simulator to different cortical areas and mapping out exactly what part is related to language, what part is, um, or, or in this case, motor with face, arm, and hand following the homunculus and keeping those areas separate from the resection, which then you know, takes place beyond that. Um, this type of uh, stimulation mapping in awake brain surgery certainly captivates the uh, attention of the media and there's no shortage of these kind of articles where different folks are uh, tested in different means. Um, you know, the, the types of testings that can be done with awake surgery are not limited to just motor and speech, but in different regions of the brain, 
that are responsible, especially for like musical technique and musical appreciation are things that are, we're able to test intraoperatively as well too. And uh, some of the clips here are from some different cases where people have either uh, been performing, you know, uh, by singing uh, while undergoing uh, brain tumor resection or playing a musical instrument like guitar or violin, or you know, in, in this day and age, uh, the new instrument uh, of everyone's choice of live streaming on uh, Facebook. But all of this um, mapping has certainly led us to appreciate um, uh, deeper understanding of you know, which areas of the brain are really critical for language function or other functions and really just gain tremendous insight in further into how the brain works. They generate um, these sort of uh, probability maps of different regions of the brain of, you know, what is the probability of it not being involved in speech. And you can see that um, sort of centered around the sort of classical idea for Broca's and Wernicke's area, there are some more speech activations, but it's certainly far from any kind of anatomic uh, map or diagram and is highly variable from patient to patient. That all being said, there is good data to support that the use of all these mapping strategies uh, can be um, can help increase the extent of resection of tumors and decrease uh, neurologic deficits. That's really uh, borne out in this meta-analysis from DeWitt Hammer uh, and and company, which um, you know I think. Uh, having it go sort of both ways is really optimal, you know, decreasing deficits, increasing extent of resection. Uh, so that's, you know, one that really uh, needs to be utilized. Um, once mapping is complete, you know, we determine resectability and try to remove the tumor um, in a, uh, whatever fashion is sort of feasible given how close or far it is from eloquent areas. Um, if feasible, well, we like to perform, you know, an on-block technique, which is basically removing the tumor in one, one piece, um, if separate enough from uh, those functional areas. I think I'll skip over uh, some of this in the interest of time. This is what, um, you know, that kind of resection um, would look like removing the tumor. And, you know, with good functional mapping, even, you know, tumors that look like they're located in motor and sensory or in language areas uh, can, you know, even ones displacing all of those aforementioned tracks can be removed safely and often in an on-block uh, fashion um, with no uh, functional limitations. So uh, putting all of this together is really how we optimize uh, the resection, you know, safe resection of uh, patients with primary malignant tumors. Um, I have a few notes on some other things, which I think we'll skip over in the interest of time, unless anyone has any um, specific question on that. Um, I think um, you know, we can sort of wrap things up here and just leave it at, you know, uh, with the conclusion, uh, detailed planning and appropriate use of these techniques. We can maximize uh, the extent of resection and not and, you know, do this without incurring additional uh, costs in terms of post-operative deficits. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.